Tonight, I'll be teaching you on unicorns. Finally, this has been a teaching that a lot of people have been waiting for for a very long time. The title will be Unicorns in the Bible. Let's look at Psalms chapter 92 and we'll look at verse 10. Before I cover this, I'm going to mention the following concerning about unicorns. So what are unicorns? From what you see, they are depicted within fairy tales and myths and you see so many pictures and legends and there was even a craze going on concerning about unicorns with unicorn products and a lot of people are wondering about are unicorns real and some people if they want to dig deeper are they in the bible are they mentioned in the word of god and yes the bible mentions about unicorn but how much is truth or how much is fiction well unicorn well Unicorn is mentioned in the Bible nine times. It is mentioned nine times in the Bible. These are the following passages that you will find on unicorns. The first one is Numbers chapter 23 and verse 22. Now, we're not going to look at all these passages. I'm just writing them out. The next one is Numbers chapter 24 and verse 8. The next one is Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 17. Deuteronomy 33 and verse 17. Job chapter 39 and verses 9 through 10. Chapter 39 verses 9 through 10. The next one will be Psalms chapter 22 and verse 21. Psalms chapter 22 and verse 21. The next one is Psalms chapter 29 and verse 6. The other one is Psalms chapter 92 and verse 10. And then the last one is Isaiah chapter 34, verse 7. These are the nine times that the Bible mentions unicorn. Some criticize the King James Bible because the King James Bible translate a certain Hebrew word where scholars will claim it would be more accurate to translate to ox or rhinoceros. That's what they would claim and that's what they would state because there's no such thing as a unicorn. Who would dare believe in this fairy tale about a unicorn? Ridiculous, the KJV translators mistranslated that word. Well, actually, the KJV translators, they were super duper accurate that actually they weren't being more mythological, they were just being more accurate in their translation. You might say, how so? Because in Webster's 1828 dictionary, for some of you who don't know, a unicorn is not what you think. A unicorn simply means in Webster's 1828 dictionary as follows. The first definition is an animal with one horn, the monoceros. This name is often applied to the rhinoceros. How about that? Another one is the sea unicorn is a fish of the whale kind called narwhal, remarkable for a horn growing out at his nose. So the reason why the KJV translators uh, translated, excuse me, the translators translated the Hebrew word to unicorn is to be more accurate as a one-horned beast. That's the idea, a one-horned animal or beast. Why is that a more accurate translation? Because when you look at several passages, there is no way where you can fit that to a rhinoceros or to other creatures. So it is more accurate to say it would be referring to a one-horned beast because the word unicorn can universally apply to all sorts of animals that are one-horned. What's interesting is like a great example is when we look at the book of Psalms chapter, let's see over here, 29 and verse 6. If we were to look at Psalms chapter 29, and verse 6, you would see the reading here that it's not likely to be a rhinoceros. It cannot skip or jump around. It feels more like a deer or even a horse, so to speak. Psalms 29, verse 6, He maketh them also to skip like a calf, Lebanon and Syrian like a young unicorn. So at times it, we can see in the Bible, I see mostly over here, you can see an ox over here, and most of these passages but in some of them it wouldn't make sense 
So we see one example here, Psalms chapter 29 and verse 6, where it's like a, like it skips like a calf or a deer. And as a matter of fact, it is very interesting. If you look at Time magazine, they have a one-horned deer. So they discover a one-horned deer. So who knows if that's what the psalmist was referring to. But the point is, is that the translation itself is super duper accurate, if not more accurate than rhinoceros or ox or whatever the scholars would have to pick. Here's another interesting thing, is that unicorn fossil is actually discovered. And it was described by Alexander Brandt. And he mentions about this unicorn fossil, which is similar but distinct from typical rhinos of today. The following is actually found at Real Siberian Unicorn. That's the name they call it. Real Siberian Unicorn Remains Found, written by Juliet Perry, CNN, CNN News article, 29th of March, 2016. See, not too long ago. It's not too long ago. It's not a fairy tale myth. But here's something interesting over here. They call this creature, which is similar but distinct from a typical rhinoceros, they call this rhino-like creature unicorn, and these are scientists who termed it that way. Why, if your King James Bible was talking about a rhinoceros type of creature and called it a unicorn, I think that can be scientifically accurate if the scientists will use the same thing. How about that? Another thing is if you look at Psalms chapter 29 verse 6, we can see that this is pretty similar to the unicorn depicted in actual myths about the white horse with the one horn. Because as Psalms 29, 6, notice it skips like a calf, this unicorn. Another one is Psalms chapter 92 and verse 10. Notice over here, this is not an ox with two horns. It shows over here a one-horned creature, Psalms 92, 10. But my horn shalt thou exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. So we can see over here, combining these two verses, it is very possible that this could be the uni a unicorn depicted in myths. But not only that, you got so many ancient authors like Tessius, Strabo, Pliny the Younger, uh, Alien, and Cosmos Indicoplustes, where they mentioned and claimed they saw this type of unicorn figure. So the simple answer that a lot of people don't take account of is this. Instead of dismissing it as, well, it's a myth. Well, how do you not know that if unicorns really did exist, but they became extinct and their fossils are yet to be found? It's that simple. I mean, look at the evolutionist paleontologist. There's so much fossils that are yet to be found, but we know it's out there to prove evolution. Look at that. If they can go by that kind of assumption, and that's a scientific assumption, why not the same thing with the unicorn? Especially people who were there at that timeline. Yeah. Not people who were like thousands of years later and then think, oh, it's a fairy tale and a myth when you never even saw it and you weren't even close to that timeline. Tessius described the unicorns as wild asses as large as horses that had white bodies, red heads, and dark blue eyes, and a horn on the fore forehead, which is about a foot and a half in length. He also said that the horns were multicolored. Now, isn't that interesting? So they were like multicolored, kind of like a rainbow, kind of like a rainbow unicorn. So it's like a multicolored unicorn. Dazzle, 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 dazzle. <laughs> Amen. And that the animals were so swift and powerful that no creature, neither the horse or any other, could overtake it. This is found at the article, A Brief History of the Unicorn, by Time Magazine. Tiffany Sharples, the author, June 12, 2008. Now let's look at Genesis chapter 10, verse 9. Genesis chapter 10, verse 9. Where do we get the idea of this one horn and the unicorn? Let's look at some interesting statements. Now, Jack Chick, he would depict and draw Nimrod in his comic books 
as a king who wears one horn for his crown. Why would he do that? Well, actually, he may not be far-fetched from his drawing like he supposed. The unicorn, you'll find out every time you see the horn in the Bible. Now, you saw the book of Psalms. The horn of a unicorn anoint my head like fresh oil. What that was is that that was like a horn that was used to anoint kings. And if you look at the Middle Ages, they would claim that they had these unicorn horns and that would connect with royalty and kings would have it. Isn't that interesting? Why would it be a prized treasure among royalty? Because horn, whenever you look up horn in the Bible, this is very interesting. Look up the word horn in the Bible. It connects to dominion power. It connects to a king. Yes, sir. Wow. Now let's look at Nimrod over here. Genesis chapter 10. What does he connect to the unicorn? Verse 9. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord. Look at verse 12, his kingdom, and 11. Out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh, and the city Rehoboth and Kala, and Resen between Nineveh and Kala, the same as a great city. Now notice that Nineveh and other places are mentioned. So we see over here that it is connected to the Assyrian region, and he is a mighty hunter. Taking into account that Nimrod is a mighty hunter and he is known to be living in the Assyrian region, it is very interesting that supposedly the legend goes that Nimrod, he mightily hunted a bull with his bare hands. So Nimrod supposedly conquered this bull with his bare hands and by conquering the bull with his bare hands, he actually took the horns of this bull. Why? So that he can anoint it as his crown. But it is actually where it is very interesting, as some sources would show, that it is one horn that he would take and that he would anoint it as his crown. But you see later on where le later writings that it would morph from one horn into two horns that they would say. And then some people would go, at, would go into three horns for the crown. And you might say, why is that? The reason why they would go for three horns as the crown is to represent some kind of pagan triune god over there. So Satan was trying to imitate the Trinity. But it went from two horns to three horns. And then it went from three horns into multiple horns horns so that's the reason why when you look at crowns today they would have multiple horns on your crowns that's where that's what the saying goes if that legend supposedly is true so that's where if we connect it with the bible it would make a lot of sense because the bible talks about that horn, look it up in your Bible if you don't believe me. Look up whenever the Bible mentions horn, it would connect to power, dominion. It would always connect to that. Oh, now, let's look at several other pointers here concerning, this is from the Speak Assyria website. It's an Assyrian history website. They said the following, in every ancient culture, we find the horn symbol used to deify rulers and monarchs. The founder of Babylon, Pelus, or sometimes referred to as Belus or Peel or Baal or even Baal, the confounder of language. Confounder of language. When God uh, disrupted the language at the Tower of Babel and Nimrod stole that for himself. But anyway, let's continue on. Baal, the confounder of language and the scatterer abroad. Now, isn't that interesting? Nimrod likes to steal titles from God because God scattered abroad the people at the Tower of Babel, right? Remember, Nimrod's kingdom was at the time of the Tower of Babel. That was his kingdom. But God ruined it. Baal, the confounder of language and the scatterer abroad, who was no other than Cush, the father of Nimrod, was actually deified and given a crown of horns. His son Nimrod, also known as Queen Shamaram's husband, or Semiramis, and later is reincarnated as Ninos, sometimes referred to as Tammuz, 
So Nimrod, it can also be a.k.a. Tammuz, was said to have been the actual father of the gods. And we see him as being the first of deified mortals wearing the horn crown reserved for rulers of divine nature. That's why the Bible says he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And when he hunted that bull, what happened? Well, that's where he would claim his power and get his horn. There you see your unicorn. Now, there was a unicorn trend that went super duper crazy beyond psycho at the year 2017. So the, hist the history goes, how this unicorn trend started was as follows from the article by the, this is by the Huff Post, June the 30th, 2017, Kat Hasselcorn is the author, title of the article, The Unicorn Trend Explained. It said as follows, for some of you who are unfamiliar, this trend hit an all-time frenzy recently with the unveiling of the Starbucks unicorn drink. Available for one week only, the brightly colored beverage was sweet and fruity at first sip before transforming into a pleasantly sour experience. Reviews of the taste were overwhelmingly negative, but the pink and blue drink still sold out across the U.S. because of its aesthetic appeal. The unicorn frab also kicked off other magically themed drinks, including unicorn lattes, Mermaid Frappuccinos, these days it's really just all about what looks good on Instagram. So where did it all begin? A natural food blogger in Miami is credited with kicking off the trend. She began posting photos on her blog and before long her unicorn toast was being pinned thousands of times across various social networks. Next up, Nicki Minaj brought unicorns into pop culture. In the single, Make Love, by Nikki and Gucci Mane, Nikki rides in on an inflatable unicorn float. The unicorn float instantly became the pool party accessory of the summer. So this is how the trend started, but what's the psychology behind it? Why is it that people are infatuated, drawn to this unicorn thing? As a matter of fact, it is gross, but there's a bunch of men who are into this rainbow girly unicorn and they call themselves bronies, of all things. It's like, wah! Ah! So Jeff Blandino, who's the co-founder of the makeup line Too Faced, he explains the unicorn trend, which his makeup product line was getting involved with. He mentions, as he's seeing this marketing product, the psychology of the consumers, he says this, it's about dreaming and believing in the magic of life, plus the rainbow of colors. Hey, hey, hey associated with unicorns offers a listen up fantasy world of options that's the key the reason why is it's pretty it's cute it's a fantastical realm that they can escape to but it's a, a fantastical realm of options that they can have now in this day of millennials when that draw them with the world of toleration of all kinds of beliefs and God, man, genders, etc. This is from the Queer Cafe. This is why they love the unicorn. This is from their article uh, in their unicorn section, Unicorn as Queer Symbol, in their website, Queer Cafe. In the last century, the unicorn has made its appearance in the LGBTQ community. Rainbows and unicorns are so intrinsically linked that it's not surprising that the magic creature started to appear on t-shirts and banners at gay pride parades around the world. The unicorn as a symbol of things that are fanciful, exotic, unique, and different makes it the perfect queer emblem. The legend of the unicorn combines, now I don't know if you knew this, this is the legends behind the unicorn, and you're going to see a little bit of it later on. I'm going to give you some quotes. The legend of the unicorn combines male and female in one beast, and therefore rich in the symbolism of opposites. It represents the balance of the yin and yang. The unicorn can be a sweet, innocent pony, but it also has a, listen up, phallic, horn 
protruding from its head. It's disgusting. Now, if you connect that back to the legends, didn't they have an infatuation with phallic symbols? Yeah. So would the pagans do that with the unicorns back in biblical times? We shall see. But let me keep reading here. It's a symbol of freedom to be male and female. In other words, it's an iconic example of the possibility, listen up, possibility to be whoever you want to be. See, that matches with the previous statement. Fantasy world of options. Separate from, separate from any limiting binaries. Its gender fluidity seems emblematic of our times and relevant to the gender queer and transgender community. <laughs> I look like a brony just now with rainbows coming out of my head just now. Now, if that's the case, then is there a psychology that's pretty sexually dark then? If that's the psychology behind the unicorn, is there more sexual dark things behind it? One of the greatest examples that you probably see in schools or some you didn't see it yet, but I seen it in my class. It's called, uh, have all of you heard about uh, the gingerbread man, but they call it the gingerbread, uh, they call it like uh, the gender person or something like that. So they transform this, uh, what they do is with this gingerbread man, they want the children to question, you know, male or female and pick whatever they want. That's the idea because when you look at the gingerbread man, but they don't like to call it that because then you're a male chauvinist. So then gender, person, etc. Then you, from this one, you can pick whatever you want to be the gingerbread man when you put the fillings or a woman or whatever you want to be. But guess what? This is supposed to be even discriminatory itself. So what they chose was this guy. And they call it the gender unicorn. And the gender unicorn, I, I, when I did that thing, I never questioned my identity so much in all my life. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. This is disgusting. So what they do with the gender unicorn is that they'll mention about, um, they'll put male or female here and they'll put an energy level bar. So that you can lean how much more, uh, they don't call male or female, they'll call it like masculine or femin feminine, or they'll, motion, uh, they'll put other bars like sexuality, which level. And so you see that, then there is no such thing as a clear difference of being a man or a woman. Anyone can be sexual fluidity, just as beautiful as a unicorn. Wicked. It is wicked as hell. The gender unicorn, they like that. But let's look at other things. Uh, BBC culture, this is from Alastair Souk in the article, Why We've Always Loved Unicorns, even admitted that the unicorn's horn is described as potentially phallic nature of its defining characteristic. As a matter of fact, 7th century scholar Isidore of Seville wrote, quote, the unicorn is too strong to be caught by hunters. That's how the story goes. So then... In the seventh century, how does the story go to catch a unicorn? Too strong for the hunters, except by a trick. Listen up. The trick is this. If a virgin girl is placed in front of a unicorn and she bears her breast to it, all of its fierceness will cease and it will lay its head on her bosom and thus quieted is easily caught. So there's something sexually perverted and wrong over here even during the, even in older times. This is found in the article, Fantastically Wrong, The Weird Kind of Perverted History of the Unicorn by Wired. Uh, by Wired. The author is Matt Simon, January the 4th, 2015. But actually, I don't know if you all know this, but you just have to do a simple encyclopedia or Google search. They'll all admit this when you look at the history of the unicorn. When they mention about the Middle Ages, a unicorn would do that uh, with a virgin woman then what they would depict it as is a Virgin Mary and the unicorn as a pure innocent as Jesus. But if you know some of the Catholic teachings, they teach this. Jesus is an angry God at heaven and how the Virgin Mary is a mediatrix on our behalf to appease his anger against us is by this example, the Virgin bearing her breast to the unicorn. I don't know if you knew that. They teach that. They won't say that. 
Just dig up through the Catholic teachings. Some of them taught that. That's like disgusting. But see, that's why during the Middle Ages, why did they come up with that kind of perverted story? Because it matches with their perverted kind of ideology of their dark religion, Catholicism, of their idea of Jesus, of their idea of the Virgin Mary. Wait a minute. If you know your uh, rewind, do you know your history here? If you know the Virgin Mary and the baby Jesus who they're supposed to represent in your book, Two Babylons by Alexander Hisla, what are they supposed to represent? Nimrod, or a.k.a. Tammuz, and who? Semiramis. So the Virgin Mary is Semiramis. So you see something dark is going on here. The thing that is dark over here is concerning about the Catholic ideology of their Virgin Mary and their idea of their own Jesus, which is actually Tammuz, Nimrod. This is the dark paganism that's going on. Now, let's keep reading over here. I don't know if you knew this. This is by BMJ Journals, August 2016. Uh, the title of this article, and they actually did, uh, uh, they did experiments with this to find the results. So this is testable. This is scientific. Unicorn Cartoons, Marketing Sweet and Creamy E-Juice to Youth by Robert K. Jackler and Divya Ramamuthi, if I pronounce her name right. So this is a, uh, they're doing a scientific case study here, and this is really, really dark. So they were selling these products to children, unicorn products to children, and I think you can still find it on Amazon today. But they were selling unicorn urine and feces to children in a playful kind of way. Obviously not real unicorn uh, urine and feces, but in a playful kind of way, and you can even eat them. They're supposed to taste very delicious. Quote, most illustrations of unicorns show them as happy, playful, and cuddly creatures. Unicorn e-juice products most often are named after the creature's supposed secretions and, excre and excretions. Milk, breath, tears, blood, puke, vomit, poop, piss, spew, and, and I'm not going to say the other word. In advertisements, the e-juice emanates from the appropriate bodily orifice of the unicorn. This is supposed to be innocent toward children, and you can buy them. They don't put like rated R or something messed up over here. It's publicly all, it's public on Amazon. It's messed up. Look at Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus 18 and 2 Samuel 8. We're going to look at Leviticus 18. 2 Samuel 8. Guess what? It's not new in the Bible. God knows the psychology and nature of man. That's why when we look at current events and history, it makes so much sense why man would have some kind of sexual infatuation with the unicorn type of creature. Very strange. Why would they put a phallic symbol with a horse? Why, why cover all the kind of ground and create a unicorn? Why is it in their dark psychology? The Bible warns you, Leviticus chapter 18, verse 23. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall, look at this, kind of like what God predicted that they would try to put some kind of virgin woman with a unicorn. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there too. Wow. It is confusion. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 4. You know what David did with the pagan horses? Oh, yeah. You know what he did with those pagan horses? Because God warned at Leviticus 18, these pagan nations, which David later conquered, that they were doing bestiality yeah. with the animals. David knew they were doing something with the horses, so guess what? He did their hamstrings. So look at this, 2 Samuel chapter 8, and we'll read verse 4. And David took from him a thousand chariots and seven hundred horsemen and twenty thousand footmen, and David hewed all the chariot horses. You know what that is? That's being, he's hamstringing them. That's the idea, hamstrung. So what did he do? Because there was something sexually dark going on. God knew what was going on. Now, with all this 
satanic symbolism going on with unicorns, what, what would Satan's people view it as? Oh, they see that as something important then, wouldn't it? Something pagan and dark, they would view that as something very important to their system. Well, let's look at a few examples over here. If you do a simple Google search on New Age symbols, you'll, f you'll find similar quotes like the following. New Age symbols such as the rainbow, Pegasus, the unicorn, the all-seeing eye of Freemasonry, and triple sixes, triple sixes, 666, were to be increasingly displayed. Now, Dr. Kathy Burns, she has a book which I remember that my father had on the shelf, Masonic and Occult Symbols Illustrated. But in that book, she also demonstrated that the unicorn is supposedly a symbol of a coming antichrist, heralding as the Messiah, conquering to bring peace on the earth. Remember Revelation chapter 6? The antichrist is on a white horse, conquering and to conquer. Whoa. You want something more wild? A lot of us here... about certain globalists and dark forces and occult. And if you want to go to like the top, one of the people at the top that you would notice is the Rothschild. They would combine them with their conspiracy theories. But if you, did you look at the Rothschild's coat of arms? If you look at the Rothschild's family coat of arms, who a lot of people connect as the top, one of the top globalists, at the right hand side is a unicorn. Here's another one. This is by occult author Nancy Hathaway in her work, The Unicorn, page 161. The unicorn here is once again a symbol of transformation, for this unicorn seeks a better world through the purifying, purgative powers of destruction. Its purpose, like that of the Hindu god Siva or Shiva, is to tear down and renew. Here's a, work, here's a quote from the Dictionary of the Esoteric. In alchemy, the unicorn was associated with the male, female, <laughs> or androgynous mercury, a motive indicating attainment of a great work. See, those, those, homo those sodomites, they weren't kidding. They knew what they were digging up for. That's why they loved the unicorn. Why? Because any sexual perversion would love something satanic. 33rd degree Freemason, Manly P. Hall. A lot of people heard of that name. You know what he said in his book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages? The single horn of the unicorn may represent the pineal gland or third eye, which is the spiritual cognition center in the brain. The unicorn was adopted by the mysteries as a symbol of the illumined spiritual nature of the initiate, the horn with which it defends itself being the flaming sword of the spiritual doctrine against which nothing can prevail. Here's another one from Richard Machka in the Rosicrucian Digest, May 1977. You know those Rosicrucians, they get involved with the cultic symbolisms as well, right? Occultic themes. Here's what, they, here's what he says. The unicorn may have been killed as an earthbound entity some centuries ago, but the image of the beast as the embodiment Embodiment of spiritualized force is still valid. Wow. What does the Bible have to say about that? Go to Revelation 13, Daniel chapter 8, and Daniel chapter 7. Look at this now. Revelation 13, Daniel 8, and Daniel 7. The Lord knew this a long time ago, that this was coming for the Antichrist, and it was something satanic. Look at Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8. We'll start off with Daniel chapter 8. So Manly P. Hall, 33rd degree Freemason, said that the horn would represent the all-seeing eye. The pineal gland. Is that what the Bible would demonstrate? Daniel chapter 8. Look at this now. 
We're going to look at verse 21. And the rough goat is the king of Grisha. And the great horde, this horn, right? That is what? Between his eyes. Oh, there's your unicorn there. Horn that is between the eyes. Would, that, would the Antichrist come out of that horn? Yes. Keep reading. We're going to look at verse 23. And the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full. Now, see if this matches with the Antichrist. A king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. But his power shall be, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper, and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against God, the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand, but he's going to lose in a battle against God. That's the Antichrist. But let's see something even more plain than that. Look at Daniel chapter 7, verse 7. Daniel 7, 7. We know that this fourth beast at Daniel 7, 7 is referring to the Antichrist kingdom, his beast kingdom. But notice what the Bible describes this beast Keep reading over here. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another, what? Little horn. But look at this now before whom were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were what? Eyes, like the eyes of a man. There's your lightened eye over there. Wow, your King James Bible is way ahead of the occultists before they discovered their enlightened teachings. Yeah. No, God knew a long time ago. That's right. You had to travel 33 degrees levels up to figure that out, man. For if you were a Freemason like Manly P. Hall. And a mouse speaking great things. See that? Illuminated. Be, because you reach that eye level, you're supposed to have all that enlightenment and wisdom and you can speak great things. And your King James Bible is something else, yeah. my friend. Look at verse 11. This is the beast, the Antichrist beast. I beheld them because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. The Antichrist, I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. See, that's God judging the Antichrist, which you can find easily at Revelation 19 where he burns him. Now let's look at Revelation chapter 17. Revelation 17. And then we're also going to go to Daniel chapter 2. We're going to look at Revelation chapter 17. And we're going to look at Daniel chapter 2. Now that... <laughs> oh, we didn't hit Revelation 13. Thank you. So Revelation 13, which I ignored, I'm sorry. So then, if this Rosicrucian person mentioned that the unicorn's resurrection, he, he labeled it as, the, as what? The resurrection of the unicorn. The image of the beast. Did the Bible say that? Yeah, Revelation chapter 13. And notice what the Bible says at verse 14 and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make what? An image to the beast. Look at this resurrection, which had the wound by a sword and did live. Whoa! And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. Wait. Rosicrucian Digest. The unicorn may have been killed as an earthbound entity some centuries ago, but the image of the beast as the embodiment, embodiment of spiritualized force is still valid. He's talking about the death and resurrection right here of a unicorn. Compare that with the image of the beast. Makes you wonder when the Antichrist comes and then they set up the image of the beast, perhaps it can be, uh, I always open it to artificial intelligence, virtual reality. Could be a statue itself or it could be a unicorn or it could be all three. Wow. If God can play double application with Scripture, can't the devil? 
Yikes. Look at Revelation 17 and Daniel chapter 2. Revelation 17 and Daniel chapter 2. Let's wrap it up. Thank you for your patience. We're going to wrap it up here, but the ending is the best. So we have to go to the ending. You're going to love the ending part here. So then what will unicorns play throughout the tribulation? Do they play a significant part in the tribulation? This is probably cold-blooded. This is, this is going to turn your blood cold. CRISPR pioneer. Now they're the ones that are into DNA and all this gene stuff. CRISPR pioneered, I believe her last name is pronounced as uh, Doudna or Doudna. She claims this, that we are not too far away from having unicorns in the future. Quote, this is from CRISPR pioneer Dudna envisions a world of woolly mammoths and unicorns written by Sharon Begley. And this is from the STAT magazine that covers medical stuff and science. June 11, 2017. Quote from the article, this Dudna doesn't hold back. We are on the cusp, quote, of a new age, new age, see that? New age, new age. Remember what I told you about new age symbolism and they connect that with the unicorn? We are on the cusp of a new age in genetic engineering and biological mastery. She says she is not kidding that CRISPR could bring about woolly mammoths, winged lizards, and unicorns. It won't be long before CRISPR allows us to bend nature to our will. What does the Bible say about that? Well, Revelation 17, verse 12, 10 unicorns here. You know why? Each king is one horn. Look at this, 10 unicorns. Ver Revelation 17, 12, And the 10 horns which thou sawest are 10 kings. See that? which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast, the Antichrist. See, there's going to be ten unicorns showing up. And the Antichrist, Nimrod is a picture of the Antichrist. Maybe the Antichrist too, especially since Daniel mentioned about that horn is called the Antichrist. But keep your hand here. Don't lose your hand here. Go to Daniel 2. Are these unicorns going to show up at the tribulation? Yeah. Look at this one. This will turn your blood cold. Daniel chapter 2, look at verse 41. People are trying to find out who are these ten toes that are part of clay, part iron. Verse 41, And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay, part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. So there is a kingdom in the future tribulation from the toes. Wait, ten. So that matches with 10 kings of Revelation 17. But let's see if these are the same kings. Yes, sir, because look at verse 44. In the days of these kings, see that? Shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So notice over here that these 10 kings with their kingdom at the tribulation. So this is, these are undoubtedly the same ten kings. But look what these unicorns do. 43. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they, these ten kings, shall what? Mingle themselves with who? The seed of man. They're intermingling. Wait a minute. Maybe CRISPR with playing with DNA? Human, what if they do that with human DNA? Are they playing with human DNA with the unicorns maybe? Here's another one. Let's say, let's take CRISPR out of the picture. The Bible says unicorns are mingling with humans. What, is this new? Is this new? Remember what was that sexual dark psychology? A unicorn captures a virgin, innocent woman. Genesis chapter 6. Now I got two wild things, Come on. my finale cards Come that you'd on. like. But guess what? These unicorns over here, these unicorns over here are actually going to turn against that virgin Semiramis, Revelation 17. They're not suckled by her. They used to. 
but they turn against her. Look like at Revelation chapter 17, verse 16. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. How about that? These unicorns who were suckled by the Catholic church whore system for so many years, they turn against her. Wow, talk about irony. Now, Revelation 2 passages as we close it. This is the finale card now I'm going to show you. Go to Revelation 19 and Isaiah 34. Revelation 19 and Isaiah 34. Now, as you study all this about the rainbow and the unicorn, you might think, man, there is so much Satanism, occult, occultism, wickedness, sexual perverseness, etc. But to be quite honest, you've got to realize this, is that actually the unicorn is supposed to be a good symbol. Didn't you know that? Really? Yeah, it's supposed to be a good symbol. The rainbow was started from God. It's Satan who took God's creation and turned it into something so dark, satanic, and perverse. So, please, you know, when your little child has a cute unicorn pet, don't tear it in front of your little girl's uh, face, and then the girl starts crying. The rainbow and the unicorn, believe it or not, it may be more true than you think, and it may be even biblical and spiritual, as you think. You might say, how so? Well, let's... Let's look at Revelation chapter 19, verse 11. The Bible says, When Jesus Christ comes down at Armageddon, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I, uh, oh, excuse me, I'm reading Revelation 20. Ugh, wrong one. All right, Revelation 19, 11, sorry. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. See that? And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. Righteousness he doth judge and make war. Notice that at verse 14, the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And notice that they, verse 15, smite the nations through God's fierceness of his wrath. So at the tribulation, God comes down on white horses with his armies and they conquer the Antichrist forces and his kingdom. Isaiah 34. What's your point, Pastor? Dr. Ruckman drew a picture in his apocalypse that at Armageddon we're all riding on white unicorns and it may not be far-fetched as you think. Isaiah 34, verse 2, look at this. This is Armageddon. Same passage, Revelation 19, God striking the nations in fierceness and wrath. Verse 2, for the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations and his fury upon all their armies. That matches Revelation 19 to a T. He hath utterly destroyed them, he hath delivered them to the slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved. Uh, look at verse 4. That's tribulation. That's Armageddon, no doubt. Verse 5, that matches Revelation 19, his sword wiping out the enemy. Armageddon, no doubt. Verse 6, Armageddon, no doubt, matches Revelation 19 to a T. But who's coming down with him? Verse 7, and the unicorn shall what? Come down with them. Whoa! Wow. Look at your King James Bible, man! And who says that's a boring book? You know what's even more interesting? If you look at 6 and 7, it mentions all these animals as a sacrifice to the Lord. But the unicorn is distinguished from all these animals. All these animals in 6 and 7 is represented as a sacrifice to the Lord. Ox, bull, uh, lamb, whatever they, they mention over here. But the unicorn is not with... When you read that passage carefully, unicorn is not within that context. It's the unicorn that comes down with them and creates that sacrifice of those animals. Whoa. Whoa. And your Bible said white horses. Wow. Do I believe in unicorns after this? Food for thought. I, I'm not, I'm, don't go around saying, Gene Kim believes in unicorns. Just food for thought, something interesting in the scriptures. God, my Father, dismiss us now with your blessing. What an incredible book. That's all I'll say. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.